Okay, good evening and happy Hanukkah, everyone. Tonight, Torah studies about Hanukkah. And we know there is Hanukkah, of course, Hanukkah and Purim are the two rabbinic holidays. We have a number of biblical holidays. And the two rabbinic holidays is Hanukkah and Purim. Purim, of course, well, came first. We had uh, Purim was doing the, between the first and the second temple. I mean, it was in the year 357 BCE. And the Jewish calendar is 3404, where they started with Haman and everything. The Jews were in danger of annihilation, annihilation and Hashem saved them. And that's we celebrate Purim. Jews were saved. Hanukkah happened in the year, the Jewish year, 3610. That's uh, 161 BC. And this was, of course, during the time of the Second Temple. And uh, there was the ruler of the, the Assyrian Greeks, the king Antiochus. And he came up with different um, decrees against the Jewish religion. Originally, it was done in a very nice and smooth way. He tried to convince the Jews to follow their ways, to be more enlightened. But then, of course, it led up into, into more decrees, stronger decrees. And, of course, with the miracle then, when the Maccabees, they started, they started a war and they fought and they won, they were victorious, they came into the temple and they saw the temple destroyed and they rebuilt the temple, meaning they redid the menorah and they went looking for oil and they couldn't find the pure oil, meaning the oil that was not defiled by the enemy. And uh, and then the big miracle that we all know, every kindergarten uh, child knows, the miracle of the eight days that the mineral lived. The, the oil that was supposed to last for one day lasted for eight days. This, I'm not revealing anything new. You all know this. But what I want to go in tonight is to see that there is a difference between the way we celebrate uh, Hanukkah and the way we celebrate uh, Purim. What do we do on Purim? On Purim, there, there was a whole Megillah written. There's a Langa Megillah. What is the Megillah? We read the story of Purim. It takes us a half hour in the shul. We come together. We read the story at night. We read the story during the daytime. On Hanukkah, we don't find this. There is no Megillah. What do we do? Hanukkah, we light the candles. We do mention a little bit uh, in the prayer, Va'ala Nisim, in during the Amidah prayer, we add some of the prayer, we add Va'ala Nisim, thanking God for the miracles, and we say, in short, the story of what happened on Hanukkah. And what we, we want to, the question we're asking is, why? Why the difference? Why by Purim we'll read the whole Megillah, the whole story, of Hanukkah, of uh, Purim, and yet when it comes to Hanukkah, we read not much, but we do. We go, we light the candles. Yes, we eat latkes and donuts. Of course, that's uh, customary. But in Alacha, we don't have this reading of the big Megillah. So let's look inside. So for Hanukkah, there is no Megillah reading. Why? Why not? What do we say in Hanukkah? We say the Va'al Nisim. This is during the, 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 the davening of the Amidah, during the Birka Samazan, also when we eat the, uh, the meal. After the meal, we have the grace after the meal. And then there also we say this Va'al Nisim. What do we say in the Va'al Nisim? We say the story in short. In the days of Matis Yahu, The son of Yechanan 
the high priest, the Hashmanayim, and his sons, when the wicked Hellenic government rose up against your people, Israel, to make them forget your Torah and violate the decrees of your will, <clears throat> but you in your abundant, abundant mercies stood by them. And in the time of the distress, you waged their battles, defended their rights, and avenged the wrong done to them. You delivered the mighty into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of the few, the impure into the hands of the pure, the wicked into the hands of the righteous, and the wanton sinners into the hands of those who occupy themselves with your favor. Okay, so that, that's, that's the whole story. That's what we read. And which is much different than what we read in Purim. Purim, we sit uh, for half hour, read the whole Megillah, the whole story. In addition to that also, we know that uh, the story of the Megillah, we read it with, twice. We read it at night and we repeat it during the daytime. But this, the, the miracle that we tell, gave thanks to Hashem for the Hanukkah. Yes, of course, we read it also, also at the evening prayer. However, there is a difference between the evening prayers and the morning and afternoon prayers. The morning and afternoon prayers are obligatory. The evening prayers originally was not mandatory, it was optional. And even to this day, women are not as obligated to do the evening prayers. So it's possible, really, halakhically, it's possible that you would go by Hanukkah and not mention the story of the Hanukkah the, at, at night, only during the daytime, if you don't wash for a meal at night, or those in back in the days where they wouldn't, didn't pray necessarily always the, the evening prayer. So this is so this is the next question. Okay. This is the end of the Alanisim. You made a great, made a great and holy name for yourselves in the in your world and effected a great deliverance and redemption for your people Israel to this very day. And then your children entered the shrine of your house, cleared your temple, purified your sanctuary, kindled lights in your holy courtyards, and instituted these eight days of Hanukkah to give thanks and praise to your great name. And here is the question. That at night, we don't necessarily say this. The evening prayer is not obligatory, as are the morning and the afternoon prayers. Nevertheless, Jewish people in all places are accustomed to reciting the evening prayers and have accepted it upon themselves as obligatory. Okay. And here the Maimonides says, really, that the mitzvah of the Hanukkah candles is the one that tells the story. It says, mitzvah na Hanukkah, the mitzvah of kindling the Hanukkah lamps is very dear. One should be very careful in its observance to publicize the miracle and thus increase our praise of God and our gratitude for those for the miracles that he performed for us. So we do it through the candles. The question, however, is why? Why is this different than Purim? And, but, and, and if you think about it, it's not only Purim. Really, every other holiday has this way of celebrating. Think about Passover. What do we do in Passover? We read this, the, the, the whole uh, Haggadah. 
In every holiday, we do pray, we say those things. On Purim, on Passover, on Yom Kippur, we pray. We are constantly pray. We always say, we always do things by saying. And here in Hanukkah, it's cut down short to the Vala Nisim, and we do, we light the candles. So this, uh, this is the question that we're going to discuss and, uh, and come to a very interesting understanding. Okay. Here it is. <clears throat> the contrast of verbalizing gratitude versus lighting candles, Purim and other holidays versus Hanukkah. So the question is, why is Hanukkah celebrated differently? Why do we leave the storytelling to candles, which we can't hear anyway? You know, they say the Friedrich Rebbe used to say, we have to listen to the candles. The candles, they have a story. But again, why? Why do we listen to the candles rather than us telling the story ourselves? So, to understand why we insist on celebrating through candles, through the candle lighting rather than reading a Megillah. We need to take a closer look at the story that the Hanukkah candles tell. And we can see it, the Rebbe brings it down by the prayer that we say after the lighting the candles. What prayer do we say? Short prayer also, we sing it as a song. The way others saying it, this is the Chabad song, there's the other way of singing. What do we say there? We say we light these candles. Why? What is this? Yeshuot is. Yeshua means a saving act. Nisim is a miracle. Niflaot is wonders. Those are the things we mention in the prayer after lighting the candles. That comes from the Talmud, actually. The Talmud, the Gemara tells us, after kindling the Hanukkah lamps, one proclaims we kindle these lamps to commemorate the saving acts the miracles and the wonders. So we see, it seems like that the, in that little prayer after the candles, it tells us that we have three different types, three different types of thanking, thanking Hashem for diff three different types of things that happened that, that, are, that took place. So what are those three different things? What are the, we have Nisim, the Yeshuot, the Savings Act, and the miracles and the wonders. These, these th uh, things really can be explained. What is a saving act? Saving act is when you need help, let's say two, two, two armies are fighting a war. You're fighting against your enemy. And let's say you have your, the, the strength, the, 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 the size of the armies, the abilities are more or less equal. So either side can win. But still, you would need a Yeshua. You would need a saving act. When you realize you, either side can win, so you need Hashem to help you, to, but you should win. And they seem a miracle is when it's not equal. When it's totally, completely, this is a big army, this is a tiny army. And here you need really a miracle to take place. Think of uh, Israel, the Six Day War in Israel. When Israel was surrounded by the armies and all of the newspapers and everything, everyone uh, 
was scared that, they, that it's going to be a terrible thing happening there. And indeed, Hashem made a miracle. But in six days, Israel was victorious, took over all of the armies. And that was a mess. That was an open miracle. Even the secular newspapers called it as a miracle. And then you have Niflaot. Niflaot means wonders. Wonders is something that is, in a way, a combination of both. You can have something which is perhaps a natural, it could be natural to equal forces, that you could say naturally you could win them, but then something happens, let's say the, the, the commander of the enemy drops dead and the people get scared and they run away. But you can say it happened in a natural thing and you can say, yes, it could, could be natural, it could be a wonder, you know, it happens to be that, is, that this just so happened, just a coincidence and, and this was a pella, this was a miracle, a, a wonder. And the truth is, there is also a fourth level. The fourth level is the ultimate miraculous wonders. You know the song, Miracles, Amazing Wonders. This is Miracles, Amazing Wonders. They say, just like it says, there is Kimei Tzischa Me'eretz Mitzrayim Arenu Neflois. Like the days that we left Egypt, God will show us wonders. What does that mean? It means there will be such miracles and wonders that even compared to the miracles in Egypt, it is still considered wonders. So, there, so therefore we have these four different categories of, of thanking Hashem for those things. Now, in order to see how this fits into the Hanukkah story, we're going to read about exactly what are the events that took place and what are, we, what are we thanking Hashem for? So we're going to look inside. We're going to read the text from the book of the Maccabees. Okay. So we have the different categories. We have savings act. We have a miracle. We have wonders. And we have... Wondrous events, <laughs> yeah, money on the trees. As Mashiach comes, there will be money on the trees. That that would be quite a wonder, wouldn't it? So here is from the book of the Maccabees, telling the story. The events that took place there in Hanukkah that uh, that led up to Hanukkah. So the king's officers arrived in the city of Modi'in to compel the people to turn against God's Torah and to offer sacrifices to the idols. Many Jews assembled, and Matesiao, Matetheus, Matesiao and his sons girded themselves. The king's officers said to, the, to Matesiao, you are revered and respected by your people. You have many children and a large family. Therefore, be the first to approach the altar and fulfill the king's decree, as is done throughout the kingdom and among the population of Judea and Jerusalem. That took place. Many, many Jews followed. They just gave in. They followed the king's decrees. It says, this will curry favor with the king and you will be rewarded with gold, silver, and precious gifts. Matisyahu raised a powerful voice in reply. And he said, although all the nations under the king's dominion obey the king and betray the statues of their heritage, my sons and I will nevertheless not verge even an iota, even an iota from our ancestors' statues. We will never forsake God's laws. 
and annul his covenant with us. Heaven forbid. We will therefore never obey the king's demand that we betray our statutes. When he concluded, a Jewish man stepped up to the altar in Modin to offer a sacrifice before all as the king had decreed. Matisyao saw this and was inflamed with passion and zeal. He attacked the man in a fury and slayed him at the foot of the altar. He also slayed the king's officer and destroyed the altar. Thus, he dealt zealously to protect God's law as Pinchas had, done, had once done to Zimri, the son of Salom. You know the story, Zimri, the son of Salom, in the time of the desert, time of Moses, that he killed the, tri the leader of the tribe of Shimon when he saw him sinning with the Moabites, the Midianites. And he rushed into the city and called out loudly, those who tremble before God, before God's law, and maintain the covenant, follow me. Me, la Hashem, Eli, he said. He and his sons fled into the mountains of the Judean desert and left all their possessions in the city. Those to whom God's Torah was dear followed them and fled into the desert. Okay, so this is the first event that we're talking about. So the first event, what we're giving thanks to Hashem is Allah Yeshuot, the saving acts that Hashem saved them. Because there, there wasn't a big miracle. The, 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 the Greeks were not in big numbers at that point. Just the fact, I mean, either side could have won there, but the fact that Matesio came up and Hashem helped him along and he was able to destroy, eliminate the altar and kill the enemies. And the start of this, this started the whole movement of the rebelling against these Greeks. But then what happened? After this event, Matesio fled to the mountains. And they got that they prepared because they knew that the king Antiochus is not going to fold and lay and, and back up. They knew that they need to prepare for this, for, for a war with a real army now. So that is when he formed his army, the Maccabees. What is the Maccabees, by the way? Maccabee is the Acronym of Mi Kamocha by Li Hashem, who is like you among all gods, our God. And they prepared for the war. And that was when the big miracle really took place. The miracle of the army, the mighty army, the 40,000 soldiers that Antioch sent. And they were able to be victorious over this, this mighty army. And this we continue to read in, in uh, Megillus Antiochus that describes this. It says, Bagr is the wicked boarded a, boarded a ship and fled to King Antiochus. And with him were those who had escaped the battle. Bagri said to Antiochus, though the king commanded the Jews to cease observing the Sabbath, the new moon festival, and the circumcision, they defrauded you and rebelled against you. However, the combined armies of all the nations in the world could not conquer the five sons of, of Matisyao. They are mightier than lions, swifter than eagles, and fiercer than bears. Your majesty, I advise you to send a small, I advise you not to send a small army 
or you will be ashamed before all the kings. Rather, draft every officer in your kingdom without exception, along with their armored elephants. This was the former tanks, the armored elephants were indeed very, very mighty. So that's what he did. Indeed, he gathered his army. And what did Matisio and his children do? They went, they fasted. They prayed. They gathered this little army that they were able to do, to gather. And then, after fasting and praying, they went with certainty, with confidence that Hashem is listening to their prayers and the way to fight them. As we continue to read in the Megillus and Tiyachas. This suggestion found favor in, uh, with Antiochus, who raised a powerful army from all the provi provident provinces of his kingdom. The governors of each province appeared with their, with their footmen and armored elephants. After this, Matisio's five sons went forth and fought the army, the many armies and killed many of them. But the older brother Yehuda died in this battle. When they saw that their brother had been killed, the brothers returned to the father. Matisyao asked, why did you return? They, they replied, our brother, our collective equal was slain. Yehuda was the biggest, the strongest of them all. Matisyao replied, I will go with you and fight the enemy, lest the house of Israel perish when they perceive your alarm over your brother's death. So Matisyao went out and fought alongside his sons. The heavenly God delivered the enemy's mighty warriors to them, of whom many were slain. Of the sword-wielding warriors, archers, officers, and deputies, none remained. The surviving remnants fled to distant lands. That was indeed, that was indeed a big open miracle. So this is the miracle of the war. That is one of the things we celebrate. That is one of the things we mention in the in the Haneira Salalu, in the Alanisim. This is the one, the one of those miracles. So we had uh, salvation in the incident, the beginning in the Modi'in. Then we had the miracles, Nesecha, Alanisim. Then we had the Niflaot, the wonders. What is the wonders? The wonders was when they returned after defeating the enemy, they returned to Yerushalayim and they came into the base of Mikdash, looked around, destruction. You see everything destroyed. The menorah was stolen. They had to quickly make a new menorah, but then they, found, they ran into a problem. The oils was defiled. They couldn't find a pure, a pure can, can of oil. As you read in the Talmud, when the Syrian Greeks entered the sanctuary, they defiled all the oil in the sanctuary. When the Hashmonean surged and defeated them, they searched and found only one cruise of oil with the undisturbed seal of the high priest. So this what category is this? Finding the oil. What is this category? That is a niflaot. In a, in a way, you can say this is a hybrid between the miracle and the natural. I mean, you could say, okay, well, nothing, nothing supernatural happened there. But then it's uh, you, you want to how they 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 couldn't find why? How come they didn't find this one? That that's a wonder. 
No, the end you can say, yeah, this was this was a natural thing because you know where where did they find the oil? They found it under the ground. It was hidden in the ground, and the Greeks. They didn't think of searching there. Why? Because there was a very special chamber, Lishkas Ashmanim, a chamber for where the oils were kept. So they took intentionally, they took all the oils and made it defile it. What does it mean, defile it? We know in order to light the menorah, anyone who is not ritually pure, who touches it, who touches the oil, that oil is disqualified to use for the menorah. And being that they, the Greeks, they wanted to fight against this idea of purity, of godliness. They enjoyed, they really appreciated the, the beauty of the Torah, the beauty of the mitzvahs, the, the wisdom, the intellectual uh, part of the, of the Torah, that they enjoyed, they appreciated it. But they refused to allow this concept of purity. And that's why the, 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 this was something which is supernatural, godly purity. This didn't make sense to them. However, this event, someone can argue that this was perhaps uh, a, uh, um, a natural thing. As the Rebbe says, this is a quote from the Rebbe, it says, if one insists, one can argue that the Greek the Greeks missing a single cruise of oil was a natural occurrence, especially according to the opinion that the sealed cruise was buried in the ground. Why would they, why, would, why did they say that it was buried in the ground? Because if it wasn't, and if it was moved, even if it was sealed, it could become impure even when it, if it was sealed. In the ground, buried in the ground, it was, means it wasn't moved by them. Okay, which is a rare phenomenon. Moreover, since there was a, a dedicated chamber for oil storage, the enemy had no reason to search on the ground. Nevertheless, it is wondrous that the enemy found and defiled all the cruises. Of, and this one cruise remained whole and untouched. Okay, so this is the third category of Miracles that we're thinking. And then, of course, comes the main thing, the main miracle that we all know, that miracles that totally defile the laws of nature. That this jug of oil, this cruise of oil that was supposed to last only one day, and the oil just did not diminish, did not go down. It kept burning. This, is, this was the category of a miracle that was completely miracle within miracle. There was only enough oil to light the menorah for one day. As the Gemara says, a miracle occurred and they lit the menorah for it, from it for eight days. The next year, the sages instituted these days as holidays with recitation of the Hallel and special thanksgiving in prayer and blessing. So that is that is the real the real ultimate miracle. And that is what we say in the prayer. In the prayer we say Aneus Aladan Wadlakim Alanisim what is the order? The order is the order the way it happened. It happened first. We have the, the simple miracles, the, the salvation. Then we have the missing, the, the miracles. And then we have the niflaot, the wonders. The wonder of finding the oil and the super wonder of the oil lasting for eight days. However, and we look into the end of this prayer that we say. When we say the Anerot Alalo, at the end, we say, Leodot Ulealel, Lashimcha Agado, to give thanks to your name, Al Nisecha, Veal Nifloatecha, Veal Yeshuatecha. We change the order. Let's look, see it inside. OK. 
Okay, so this is the order of the the events that took place. Jews surprised and defeated the few soldiers in Modi'in. That's the first event. Then we have the Greeks' army defeated at the hands. They they were defeated at the hands of the Maccabees. And then we have the wonders of the discovery of a single cruise of untouched oil, and then the super wonder, one cruise of oil lasting for eight days and nights. But then look at the end of the Siddur, the end of the prayer. We say, to offer gratitude and praise to your great name for your miracles, your wonders, and your acts of savings. Acts of saving. Here, the, the order is completely mixed up. Beginning, we say the acts of savings, the miracles, and the wonders in the way it happened. But here, now we confuse it completely. We mix up the whole order. Why? Why do we mix up the order? So that's the question. Why does the prayer conclude by jumbling the order of miracles? Why change to a different order at the end? So here comes the Rebbe. The Rebbe is going to explain that what, what we, do, we are doing on the holidays, we're giving thanks to Hashem. We're giving thanks to Hashem for the miracles. First, what do you see first? Where do you see, at what event do you see the necessity to give thanks to Hashem? Obviously. First, you see it by the, the open miracles. So this, you give the thanks to Hashem. So that is why the Rebbe will explain that in the beginning, what we're saying, we're saying, we light these candles for what? For those things that happened. What happened? We say it in the order that it happened. It happened the salvation, the miracles, and the wonders. But in the end of that prayer, we're saying, it, and therefore, we need to give thanks to you, Hashem, Thanks for what? So first you thank Hashem for the miracles. When you, everybody knows, everybody sees that those are open miracles. You give thanks to Hashem for this miracle. Then you go to the next level and you say, even the wonders. Those things that you can interpret it in a, in a natural way. And finally, we give even for the salvation. Even for the things that they looked at naturally, we could also win. We realize and we recognize that even for those things, we need to give thanks to Hashem. Let's see it inside. What the Rebbe says. It says, first we offer gratitude and praise for the miracles that everyone recognizes as divine. We then reflect on the underpinning reality of some of the other remarkable events until we recognize them as divine wonders. Though one can argue erroneously that they are natural occurrences, we nevertheless learn to thank God for them. And finally, we arrive at the recognition that God must be thanked and praised even for his acts of savings, of saving which are not miraculous and, and not even wondrous, but seem like ordinary natural occurrences. This is because all salvation is in God's hand. Events of nature are also miraculous because they are orchestrated by Hashem, by God. Therefore, even such events must elicit gratitude, gratitude and praise. And this is why we have this order. Okay, so now we have an explanation why we have this order in the beginning, why we have this order in the end. Now let's go a little deeper. Of course, we always have to. This is the way the Rebbe takes us. 
there was a saying, a Hasidic uh, concept, a teaching, where the Mitzvah Rebbe says there's a rule that says Kol Agavoa beYoter Yored Lamata beYoter. That which is on the highest level descends to the lower. So in a way, whatever is higher goes down even lower. So a miracle that happens from in, in an, an open miracle, in a way, is not as difficult, so to speak, for Hashem, as the miracle which is, it comes in a natural way. Because, again, because the higher one is, the lower you can reach. The example that is always used in Hasidus, when you have a tall building and you have the, and the building falling down, the brick that is sitting on top will fall down further away. So the things that Hashem does in a natural way, He's hiding His presence. In order to be able to hide a present, His presence, His essence, you need a higher form to be able to get there, to be able to accomplish in a, low, in a lower place. And this is what we recognize on Hanukkah. We recognize the fact that not only do we give thanks to Hashem for the miracles, but we recognize gradually how, where the hand of Hashem reaches. First, we say in the open miracles, of course, it's an open miracle. Thank you, Hashem. But then we bring down the godliness even lower, even though we realize that the greatest, the greatness of Hashem is that it reaches even in, in the places where it seems all natural, all normal. We realize and give thanks to Hashem for that too. Because that is even a greater revelation of godliness that he can hide and conceal himself into the nature. Just like, you know, this says uh, King Solomon. It says King Solomon was talking, when he was teaching, he was talking with 3,000 metaphors. He gave 3,000 metaphors. Shloisha Salaf and Marshall, what does that mean? What is the idea of 3,000 metaphors? Because King Solomon was so wise, he was able to bring down the deepest wisdom to the people on the lowest level. In order to do that, just like when you want to explain a concept, sometimes the concept, the person, the student cannot appreciate the concept, he doesn't get the depth of it. So you have to use a metaphor. That's what the metaphor is for. Once he gets the metaphor, he realizes, oh, that's what the teacher means. But sometimes the metaphor is also too deep to the, for the student to understand. So you have to use a metaphor to explain the second metaphor. And this is what King Solomon did. He was able to find metaphor after metaphor after metaphor to go down all the way 3,000 levels. A simple uh, a person, you know, to, to be able to go down and bring the deepest levels to the lowest places, you need to have King Solomon with the wisdom of King Solomon. So the same thing when we're talking about the miracles, the open miracles are just a miracle. Hashem breaks the laws of the nature. But to come down, to realize that even the nature is the hands of Hashem, there, in a sense, there's a greater godly revelation that it penetrates even the darkness. Let's see how the Rebbe says this. That which is on the highest bird descends to the lowest bird. This is from the Mitzvah Rebbe. So it's the Rebbe. Miracles that are thinly veiled by nature, such as finding the untouched cruise of oil, emanates from a higher spiritual plane than open miracles, such as the logic defying victories on the battlefield. And acts of God that are completely disguised as natural occurrences 
such as the victory in Modi'in, they emanate from even a higher source. To explain, it says revealed miracles flow from divine energies that are restricted by the requirements of revelation. Unable to operate in disguise. These miracles must be visible to all. Miracles that are thinly veiled by nature flow from divine energies that transcend this requirement and can therefore assume an, a natural guise. Nevertheless, the fact that the veil is weak and those who observe it can peer through it and marvel over their supernatural quality demonstrates that these energies also belong in a category of the revealed. It says acts of saving that are completely disguised as natural occurrences and thus present as lowly flow from God himself who is not constrained by any requirements. Therefore, these supernatural events that come from God himself can fully masquerade as natural occurrences. You see, this is, this is the whole thing of Hanukkah. Hanukkah, why do we celebrate Hanukkah by lighting the candles rather than chanting. Because that's what Hanukkah is about. Hanukkah is what we light the candles when it gets dark. When it gets dark, we light the candles. And we do it to the outside. We make sure that the light when it gets dark, we bring it and make sure that this goes to the outside. Because the idea of Hanukkah is that when we have, we come to a place of darkness, we realize the things that we give to Hashem is realizing step after step how the darkness really isn't dark. Not only it's not dark, but the greatest miracles is in the darkness. That will, when Hashem comes in such disguise, and we are able to reveal the darkness and see the light in them, that those are the greatest lights. This is why this is also connected with the coming of Mashiach. The darkness covers the land. There is, a, there is the Arafel, the Umim, the, the clouds over the nations. But upon you, Hashem shines. And our job is to take the light and bring it into the darkness, to realize and make sure. And that's why we don't. Because the first question we asked, why is Hanukkah different than Purim? Why Purim is we read the whole Megillah? Hanukkah we don't, we, we do the lights. Because Purim we celebrate Hashem, we thank Hashem for sal, sal, saving us physically. And Hanukkah, it is about a darkness that fell upon us, it's the spiritual darkness. And the Maccabees, they fought, they fought the darkness. And that is why the way to celebrate it is by we ourselves doing the exact same thing. We ourselves lighting the candles. This is why we pay so much attention to the candles and listen to the candles, to listen to the story that the candles tell us. This is why the Rebbe turned this holiday from being a, a small, intimate family event, quiet holiday in an eternity completely revolutionized the holiday of Hanukkah to come out all 
places in the open with the public menorahs in Manhattan, by us in Netco, Stop and Shop, a concert, celebrations, and bringing the light, reaching out with the boys that we have as we speak. We have hundreds of boys coming out in the apartment building, reaching out to Jews, lighting with them the menorah, and telling them, and telling us, telling yourself, what are we thanking Hashem? Al Nisecha, Al Secha, Al Yeshua Secha. And the miracles, and the wonders, and on the salvations, even those things that seem to be very natural to us, the day to day occurrence, we open and we reveal in the darkness, we see the light, and that is the greatest light, the greatest level of godly revelation. So may Hashem help, we should be able to see this light. We see that we are becoming victorious. We are winning. We are winning the war. Even though there's a lot of darkness, we shouldn't be scared. There's darkness around us, but we know we have the light. And therefore, we have nothing to be afraid of. And we're going to share and continue to spread the light. And that is very contagious. And now uh, that will bring the coming of Mashiach very soon. Amen. Thank you all for joining in a very Happy Hanukkah and to bring light of Hanukkah for the whole year. We can take some questions if anyone has any questions now.